My name is Samantha Siwusa and I'm the co-founder of the Pan-African News Portal Platform Africa. Welcome to our webinar hosted by Bank One in partnership with INM Bank and also Platform Africa. And th thank you very much for joining us from different parts of the world, um, from Africa itself and also from other areas. And thank you also to the press. Uh, we know we have a number of members who are joining us today. So today we're going to be taking a look at the economic outlook for the year ahead. We'll be hearing the experts, uh, experts joining us in the next few minutes, and I'll be happy to introduce them. But just to get started with a few points, the, the latest global economic forecasts by Goldman Sachs are largely bullish, predicting the world economy will expand 2.6% next year on an annual average basis. This will be driven by strong income growth and confidence that the worst of the rate hikes is now already behind us. However, geopolitical forces, such such as the possible escalation of the Israel-Hamas war and the invasion of Ukraine by Russia continue to cast shadows on the global economy, and Africa is clearly no exception. Closer to home, the conflict in Libya, the war in Sudan, and sporadic acts of terrorism in many parts of Africa are continuing to cause economic observers to conclude that this year is a particularly difficult year for the region's economy, with growth slowing to 3.3% from 4% from in 2022. However, the IMF has noted that growth is expected to rebound to 4% next year. So all in all, the current trajectory may not be easy to navigate, and I'm very happy to be joined by three experts today to take a deep dive into some of these current issues and to decipher what does it mean for those who are seeking to build and to manage their wealth within the continent. So first of all, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Bavia Shah. Bavia is the Head of Personal Financial Services at Bank One Limited. He brings nearly two decades of retail banking experience with a deep international business exposure across Asia, Europe and America. Over this period, he's played key roles in strategy, customer propositions, product management and marketing. And prior to his current role, Bavia was working with the HSBC Group, where he was global head of retail propositions, wealth and personal banking. He holds an MBA from the University of Delhi, a Bachelor of Science from the University of London, and a Bachelor in Commerce from the University of Calcutta. And he's joined Bank One in June 2021 as the Head of Personal Financial Services. So thank you, Bavia, for being with us today. Manisha Tukoni. Thanks, Manisha, for being here. Manisha is an economist. She has a double master's degree in economics and public administration from Harvard University. She's the chairperson of Mindex Limited, which offers a complete financial infrastructure to issue, trade, swap, store and manage any type of real and virtual asset. Manisha is also the chairperson of the African Legal Support Facility, a statutory organ under the aegis of the African Development Bank, supporting large investment projects across Africa, including in mining, sovereign wealth funds investments, green hydrogen, energy and large infrastructure. She has extensive experience in advising business and government leaders on investment transactions and on business development across Africa. Manisha also co-manages Africa Rise, a multi-million euro EU facility covering 25 countries in Eastern and Southern Africa, and she is also a senior advisor to the government of Namibia on investment matters. So thank you, Manisha, for being here. And finally, I would like to introduce Stephanie Kimani, who is an economist with INM Bank in Kenya. Stephanie is an economist with post-qualification experience in the financial services sector. She's worked in commercial banking, in investment banking, corporate finance, brokerage, treasury and strategy. She's passionate about customer value proposition enhancement through strategic initiatives and the execution of economic policy to improve delivery. Stephanie is deeply appreciative of the forces at play in shaping economic development, and she is particularly passionate about financial intermediation and the importance of a well-functioning financial system that fosters economic growth. So thank you everyone for being with us here today. I'm really looking forward to hearing your perspectives as we get started with our questions. Um, and the, those joining us in the audience, thank you for being here. Please do put your questions in the Q&A box, and then we'll be happy to come to those at the end. So first of all, Bavia. Uh, let's come to you. It's been a challenging year. How do you think the global economy might pan out next year? That's a that that's a very very difficult question, right? But let me let me let maybe start with a bit of uh, uh, where we are right now. 
uh, and 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 just to have a think about what are the key themes emerging. So there are four areas maybe I'll talk about. Let's start with the geopolitical situation. Uh, the Russia Ukraine wars kept dragging. And I don't believe there is a resolution in sight anytime soon. So it will continue to have, especially with Ukraine being one of the food grain capitals of the world, it will continue to have a supply challenge, right? Which will mean commodities cost, at least certainly on the food item side, will remain a challenge. Uh, the other key kind of uh, war uh, going on right now is, of course, the uh, Israel-Gaza uh, issue. Now, the good news is that it hasn't necessarily impacted any of the macroeconomic indicators, but if there is a risk of contagion and if the, the war becomes bigger, the conflict becomes bigger and more parties get involved, it will start having an impact. Uh, so wars, I think, and conflicts remains a key theme. Uh, the other aspect to that is we are seeing an increasing deglobalization around the world. Uh, we are seeing uh, more and more countries not just focus on efficiency of the supply chain, but control over the supply chain and being able to assure and secure kind of key requirements. Uh, you see that through the chip wars and everywhere else, right? Um, the third kind of key, I would say within the geopolitical section theme for me is China. And uh, although it's reopened for business, growth is slowing down out there. And with China having been the growth engine for the world for a couple of decades now, uh, that clearly has ramifications. And then the other very interesting kind of geopolitical aspect is next year, there are going to be about 90 elections, state, national, uh, Senate, and all of that. But some of them are really big. You've got elections in the US, elections in UK, elections in India, uh, and elsewhere, which could, depending on how those go, can really have long-term impacts, right? So I think the geopolitical situation is fragile. Um, if we then look at the second key theme, which is inflation, it's been something that's been a pain for most of this year, and everybody's felt the brunt of it. But the good news is uh, all indicators are suggesting inflation is starting to come down globally, everywhere else, right? Now, there is a nuance on it, which is while inflation is starting to come down, core inflation, i.e. the inflation on the food basket that we are ourselves buying, hasn't necessarily gone down at that same pace. So I don't think we can announce victory yet. Uh, and a lot of the reductions have come from energy cost reductions, etc. So I, I, I think inflation is a good story, but there's still more to go, right? When you then look at kind of like the third key theme, which is interest rates uh, and having gone through a historic rapid rate rise, I'd say it's probably nearing, if not having already neared its peak, given inflation journeys on the downtrend and most economies are now seeing it within the next 12 to 18 months, it will achieve their range goals, right? So, so interest rates are probably at the peak, but given the uh, geopolitical situation, I don't believe we can expect them to start coming down in any soon. I think uh, it's natural central banks will remain watchful uh, before you start seeing interest rates come down. And actually on the, on the same story, um, Economic demand has started to soften in most markets. Employment growth is starting to slow down. So all those indicators are there, but I think there's still a long runway before interest rates start kind of reflecting a downward trend. And then the final theme I'll talk about is economic growth. And you, you mentioned some stats, Samantha, earlier. I think you know, at a very, very high macro level, I'd say the GDP growth across most markets is expected to rebound next year. 
it will in pretty much every market it won't see the level seen pre-covid but there's definitely uh, an uptick on gdp growth in most places government debt levels have peaked and are expected to remain high there is still a very high level of deficit financing going on so so uh, I, I i i think the jury's out there but i don't believe uh, economically we are in for a hard landing or a big recession given the pressure on interest rates uh, i think soft landing in some places may be achieved and in other places it, there might be a mild recession to manage i think so overall what i'd say from a what does the very global macro view look like i would say the view would be one of cautious optimism a lot of indicators are starting to trend from the adverse positions but there are loads of headwinds and traps that really need to be navigated very carefully Thank you very much, Bavia, for setting the scene for us so well. Uh, Manisha Dakoni, let's come to you. You're an international economist and you've got a very keen sense of the investment climate across Africa. How do you see the key economies in Africa performing next year? What are the headwinds and the tailwinds that they're facing? I think uh, when we're looking at the African continent today, uh, it's quite a lot of optimism, a bit uh, from what Bavia was saying. I think I'll pick up the, that word optimism, because what we're seeing is many of them on the overall, when we're looking at sub-Saharan Africa, we're looking at a 4% growth uh, within that region. And as we know, a 4% growth may not sound a lot, but it is a lot given the past two or three years that we have uh, faced with all the all the issues post covid uh, ukraine etc that uh, that is happening so essentially we do have quite a lot of optimism because of those 4% growth and in fact when we're looking into some of the finer detail we also see that some countries are likely going to be in the high uh, well, high, close to 10 uh, percent, but some of them may even have a double digit uh, growth, uh, albeit some of them are starting from a lower base. But the fact that lower base countries, so maybe poorer countries, are able to uh, to have some double digit growth in the eastern and the southern African region, that means a lot. And it also means that as a region, it's growing. And as in economics, one of the key concepts is uh, that when your neighbor is becoming rich, you also tend to become rich. So it's like a neighborhood effect. And when we're looking at this neighborhood effect in the African region, we're really seeing countries next to each other that are really having dynamic growth. So when you look at Ethiopia, Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, Tanzania, all of them, uh, well, some of them are bound by, let's say, a treaty that is helping in, in terms of those growth. But at the same time, because of just being near each other and leveraging from the growth of each other's, uh, well, development capability, that is making these countries grow quite well and quite a lot. And uh, in terms of, uh, as you said, well, the, the headwinds and the tailwinds, I think the headwinds is really the growth that we're expecting. And I'll come to some of the sectors in a while, but uh, that's really uh, seeing fast economies, fast growth. But in the tailwind, I would say that many of the economies are still stressed under huge debt obligations. And when we look at debt obligations, first of all, uh, I would say uh, COVID didn't help. Many countries uh, had to readjust their budget to support people, to help industries, to help industries uh, not go under. This is, uh, this has put a lot of pressure on economies. As you've seen, even in Mauritius, uh, it has put quite a lot of pressure on the Mauritian economy, but things are going up. But the fact that 
uh, growth is happening, that means with the GDP expanding, that means that the debt ratio is then as a proportion going down in many of those countries, but countries are still grappling with the issue of uh, debt. The other issue, and Bavia did mention that, is inflation. And many of the countries in the region, if not most, are net importers. And uh, as net importers, that means we're importing most of the manufactured products from outside of the region. And in doing so, that means we are faced with the vagaries of prices increasing, of the uncertainty that is happening, a lot of the energy price increase that has been happening. We have been net recipients in some way of these uh, uh, price increases. The price of food items as well has been going up. We've seen recently the price of rice has gone up. And many of, uh, we're all rice eaters in this region. We all love rice and rice, the price of rice has gone up. This, all these lead to the fact that in many of the countries in the same region, um, it is predicted whether it is DRC, it's Angola, Ethiopia, Egypt, Ghana, Zimbabwe, that there might be a double digit inflation again. Although, there is likely going to be a decline towards maybe the second half of uh, the um, of the year in 2024. So, which means that countries, and when we're looking at inflationary pressure and high inflationary pressure, we know that that puts a lot of um, pressure on people itself, on their budgets, but it also puts a lot of pressure on all those who are investing and who are having to invest in uh, in, in in many uh, aspects around, uh, and who are who are also in their businesses, etc. So, which means that it makes um, well, sorry, there's someone speaking behind me, but uh, it makes um, uh, it, it does add to to the economic challenges uh, that uh, countries are facing. Uh, to Bavia's point. I'm not going to dwell into it, but as an economist, we also are looking out at the question of uh, the different um, elections that are happening over this whole region, whether it is this year or year after. There was an election that happened in uh, Madagascar last week. So uh, this, these, as we know may, uh, very often, uh, that can be a cause for political uh, tension and socio-economic tension, but we're looking at that and we're hoping that uh, that is not going to affect us that much. Thank you, Manisha. Thank you very much for sharing your insights with us. Uh, let me turn to you, Stephanie. So you're based in East Africa. I mean, tell us, Stephanie, what, what do you think this all means for Kenya or for neighboring countries in terms of the impact both on individuals and on consumers? And the, bit, the debt burden is also something which has been mentioned both by Bavia and Manisha just now. How does that debt burden translate into an impact on lifestyles of the people in the, in the area? Okay, thank you, Samantha. So yes, indeed, the heavy debt burden for a number of countries across Sub-Saharan Africa is not only just a concern for the policy makers, but as well as for the people on the ground. That is consumers and investors, just like you and me. In the same breath as that debt burden conversation has been the mention of debt default, which has recently become a reality and as well as a key concern for nations in East Africa, not only because of the economic costs of sovereign debt defaults, as well as just generally the complex nature of being able to restructure this debt, but also the risk that the development gains that have been earned over the last decade within East Africa could be wiped out if urgent action is not taken. So just to put these debt concerns into context, over the last decade, like I mentioned, debt accumulation has risen sharply. And just like Bavia and Manisha have mentioned, there has been a, an even steeper incline owing to the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as a tightening of global financial conditions. 
So I'll make an example out of the systemic debt crisis that occurred in the 1980s just to underscore why this should matter to us. Now, for many of those over-indebted countries during that particular time, but specifically I want to mention in Sub-Saharan Africa, what they faced was is that they suffered a near 10-year loss in economic development as a result of this debt distress. And they were also faced with that um, elevated inflation pressures that we're seeing currently, weakened currencies, lower incomes, as well as rising poverty and income inequalities. Of course, right now it's a different time, but the lessons we can learn from this experience, especially from those countries, just underscores the urgent need for proactive action just to prevent any kind of default on upcoming debt maturities, such as the upcoming eurobond payment in Kenya. This is so as to be able to, you know, just manage any unsustainable accumulation of debt so as to minimize the economic and social fallout. Now, just bringing it back into the East African market, the debt burden for Kenya, Rwanda and Burundi is expected to remain sticky at just about 60% of GDP in 2024. Well, for Tanzania and Uganda, it's expected to be less debt pressure at just below 50% of GDP. Now, um, as an economist, maybe this will be a bit of a jumble, but um, one has to appreciate that these countries have a varying fiscal space so as to be able to sustain their respective debt burdens. As a result, for those countries that have a narrower fiscal space, for example, like for Kenya, this has necessitated the government to um, have some fiscal adjustments through either spending restraint and or raising revenues. Now, for these countries as well in East Africa, we've also noted development organization coming in to support them, such as the IMF. But this has been on a concessional basis. However, the extent of this support from the development organizations has um is is subject to the pledges that are received from the members their member nations so i believe there's need for just that cautious reliance on such development partners and this is why in my view explains why some of these countries within east africa are seeking to mobilize additional revenue and rationalize spending so as to rely on their own domestic resources now in my opinion spending restraint is really a tough shell to crack and as such i foresee a greater push to broaden the revenue base which will be through the enhancement of tax collections, which will generally be supported through the increased use of digitization of various services. I'm also seeing an opportunity around increasing or introducing new levies just to broaden that revenue base and or raise tax rates or normalize um, tax rates in that respect. Case in point, in Kenya, we introduced a progressive tax um, re rate regime for incomes, and that ha is one of the ways the government is seeking to broaden that tax base. Now, this provides, the context of all of this provides a very interesting view on the near-term economic growth outlook for these nations. Now, while East Africa itself is expected to record an, an impressive economic growth that will outpace majority of the African na nations in 2024, I foresee a somewhat mixed bag of prosperity for these East African countries, which will largely rely on the private sector's ability to contribute to that overall momentum. Now, the darlings for East Africa, if you will, will be Tanzania, Uganda, and Rwanda that are proving just to have more sustainable growth with GDP expected to be at about 6% for both Uganda and Tanzania. And for Rwanda, I believe it's about 7%, at least according to the IMF. Now, for Kenya, our internal projections suggest that GDP growth will be about 5.4 into 2024. Just to note, just like Bavia had said, there is an anticipation that the economic momentum will remain positive and currently our focus for like for Kenya GDP growth is about 5.1 percent so we are seeing positive growth a continuation of that now the services sector will be the key driver of this growth and will greatly rely on expectations of either increased or improved demand for goods and services from households. However, there are still a number of lingering risks, just like uh, Manisha has mentioned, which could cloud this outlook. This um, risks stem from, you know, 
sticky, albeit easy in inflation, that is a result of even partly that de debt situation I've mentioned before. We're also seeing the weakening of local currencies within these nations against major currencies like the US dollar having an impact, not only on inflation, but even the um, inflation of various goods, but even just generally on the way of lives of many. We're seeing the shocks from climate change um, having an impact on food supply and the spillovers from the external market, especially from shocks that impact the cost of key commodities to which some of these economies rely on, such as food and fuel. Just like Manisha said, the cost of rice, for example, and um, wheat in Kenya as well is a, a cause of concern. Now, should all of these risks, or even some of them materialize into 2024, this should have a dampening effect on consumer purchasing power and this threatens the positive economic momentum that i've just pro um, presented to you now all in all what i can say is it is indeed a very delicate balance for policymakers, with their decisions effectively and ultimately impacting private sector activity and decisions for not only just investors but as well as households and this means that the private sector needs a delicate balance in the way they, that they, that they navigate these uncertainties moving forward Looks like Samantha's frozen out. Samantha, back to you. Yeah, she seems frozen. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. looks like that. So look, given Samantha is in there, let me play host. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Manisha, maybe, maybe let me come to you, you now and building on from the point that Stephanie was making. Um, so what what does okay, let's talk about it in terms of what can people do given uh, i think the phrase uh, 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 stephanie used was delicate balance right given that scenario uh, what do people do next year manisha you around you around you around i i i Sorry, I'm having quite a lot of issues here. Uh, can you see me? No. No. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Oh, uh, you can. Okay. At least you can hear me because, uh, well, I moved uh, from my phone to my laptop, and uh, 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 that transition doesn't seem to be working very correctly. But anyway, at least you're hearing me. Can you, um, I'm sorry, I missed a bit, but uh, what was the question? I'm sorry, could you? Yeah, no worries. Samantha's back. So I will pass the hosting privilege yes. back to Samantha. <laughs> <laughs> okay, see, so, uh, Samantha and I are having issues then. <laughs> yeah. Samantha. Good to be back. Um, so um, I was just going to remind everyone for the Q&A, please put your questions in the Q&A because we'll be coming to those in a few minutes. Um, okay, thank you again, Stephanie, for all of your own insights. Um, so let, let's turn now then to how the global economic outlook creates risks and opportunities at an individual level. Um, I know that Stephanie has already touched on those, but we can explore them a bit more, um, especially for those who are seeking to build their wealth. Um, so let's start with, uh, with Manisha, if she is still there. I am. Oh, you are. Excellent. Um, I so am, but you can't see me, it seems, but I'm there. <laughs> You're there. Marvelous. So, um, so, Manisha, then. So, so, can you give us a view of how Africans typically build and nurture their personal wealth? What are the products and solutions they're typically tending to use? And are you seeing any new trends and opportunities? So, uh, if we're looking at traditional uh, ways, for people like me who've lived uh, many years in Rwanda, you would buy a cow. You would buy a cow because that's your traditional way of keeping your wealth and showing it as well. Because the more cows you have, the more wealthy you are. And that's not just in Rwanda. That's in many of the countries across uh, the region where cattle is very much a measure of wealth. And, um, well, this is very much the traditional, but apart from that, since uh, we've moved on for, from just uh, using cattle as a measure of wealth, 
for us uh, nowadays when we're looking at the um, the region a lot of the funds have been put into bricks meaning in uh, building into land so purchase of land in places where people could purchase uh, or uh, the purchase of leases of land where places, where where you can get uh, land lease and then there has been traditionally banking, meaning keeping your funds in 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 a savings account or in a um, well in a regular, uh, let's say, long term deposit, for example. However, prior to rates going up, rates had been quite low, so many people. Didn't, uh, didn't invest so much into uh, putting their money into so much of long-term deposit, but most of it were going into assets that were growing. And some of those assets that were growing were very much into the real estate world. However, when we're seeing new trends now, and that, uh, that kind of gets also into the aspect of um, the growth areas and the zone, the growth zones in the uh, in the economy we see uh, that first of all people are investing in newer type of assets as we've seen in the eastern african region and in the southern african region with technology having picked up Lots of people have invested in technology and in technology-related uh, assets. Um, and in, in doing so, there's also now more and more fintech opportunities that uh, are being uh, provided across the region that are helping in, uh, well, in, in bringing access to funding and funding possibilities. Apart from that, we also see uh, that investments have gone when uh, for for uh, regular investors in specific sectors. Uh, the travel and tourism sector has been big. Hospitality industries have been big. Things like transport, logistic, the financial sector, the mining sector has also uh, picked up quite a lot and been uh, into uh, brought in quite a lot of those uh, dynamism and i would like maybe for us to uh, pause a little bit on the mining sector because there are new trends and new things that are happening in the mining sector that is worth us looking at and that is bringing a lot of mining relating investment so uh, and when i'm saying mining related investment it can be in purchase of mines but it also is in terms of the sales of futures uh in 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 terms of mining products etc today what has happened is the eastern world the oecd country well the western world and oecd countries woke up to the fact that suddenly they realized that China has uh, a stronghold on the value chain of critical raw materials. And uh, China has accumulated a lot of capabilities over the past uh, decades on developing uh, and, uh, and, and processing these critical raw materials. And in doing so, it has led to uh, them being um, very much the precursors in terms of uh, critical raw materials. So therefore, there's lots of funds that is being pumped into African countries today for securing uh, mining assets and securing mining outputs as well and for de delivering uh, the uh, the output in particular for things related to the automotive sector and with the uh, green energy transition that is happening across uh, the western world and in many countries across the world so therefore at some point maybe mining was a little bit less popular but we do see uh, a lot of uh, funds going into mining assets as well now okay thank you very much indeed uh, for giving us a tour of the landscape there manisha 
Uh, so let me come back again to Stephanie. So Stephanie, obviously, Manisha, Manisha's given us, uh, you know, sort of a good flavour of some of the areas currently. Is it, is it in line with what you're seeing as INM across the East African markets? And um, what are some of the lessons that individuals and investors could be drawing from this dynamic, dynamic uh, financial environment? Yeah, um, thank you, uh, Samantha. So yes, there are a number of lessons that investors and individuals can learn from what's happening in this dynamic financial environment, like you see. Um, for one, we need to appreciate that we live in a global village and the effects of globalization affect us all. That just means that anything that seems like an isolated event in one economy will most likely than not have ripple effects across other nations. Just speaking to the interdependence nature of global economies. Economies. Now, this is why forums like this really help um, individuals and investors because you're able to understand and just um, keep abreast with the information and trends that are happening in the global sphere. So, yes, I commend Bank One for having a forum like this. Now, in terms of um, tr trends that I'm seeing in East Africa, from a business perspective, as most governments' um, fiscal space remains quite constrained, like I mentioned before, there is an increased leaning towards PPP arrangements just to support development projects. So, there is opportunity for the private sector to contribute to the various governments' economic economic agendas. Further, we are seeing in East Africa that the growing youthful population is increasingly urbanizing areas near major towns. And this has helped support um, the services sector, which remains the largest sector in East Africa, contributing to over 50% and even 70% of GDP in some economies. Some sectors within services, we're seeing um, quite a bit of growth is on the transportation space, um, financial services, retail, healthcare, as well as ICT, general ICT. Now on the FinTech space, like Manisha mentioned, there is a fast, fast and welcome growth around um, activities in the fintech space, which has helped and supported financial inclusion. We've also seen a number of governments within EAC supportive of these trends, given that it is driving their agenda. Um, agenda. So that's one area that I'm seeing as some, a, a key trend to watch out for. We've also seen a number of governments really supportive of any activity around value addition and governments are also working to just try and improve the operating climate for any business that is seeking to set up factories or any manufacturing plants that will be supportive of this value addition trend. Now, in terms of consumption trends, I have noted that in consumers are increasingly more price sensitive and on the lookout for deals, given the sticky incomes that they face amid high inflation, as well as um, a generalized constrained purchasing power. This has resulted in an increased leaning towards substitutes. And thus, what I've noted is consumers are less keen on major brands than before. Now, while I foresee this being a volume play for businesses, it's as well important just to note that businesses will require will be required to offer some sort of personalization in their services, as well as a strong value proposition for the customer just to retain, to retain them as well as ensure loyalty. Now, overall in the markets, in the equity, equity space, for example, uh, we have seen um, an outflow, especially from foreigners in the equities market across the ESC, given the prospect of a higher for longer interest rate environment. And we've also noted that not only are local investors participating more owing to the fact that equities have gone down in terms of prices, but they're also preferring active stock selection over passive investment. And while some are participating in the equity space, the higher for longer narrative, interested narrative is pushing some other investors into investments in government securities, specifically T-bills and shorter dated treasury bonds, given the opportunity to roll over any maturities at higher interest rates. Like Bavia mentioned, interest rate will remain higher for longer. There may be a peak, but it's still quite uncertain for now. And it's likely that the peak will come in sometime H1 next year, the first half of 2024. So that just suggests that interest rates will continue to rise and remain higher compared to pre-COVID times. 
Just all say it with the indications, like I've mentioned, interest rates will remain higher, economic conditions will remain quite uncertain. Investors should therefore be able to, or rather there's need for investors to assemble a portfolio that will be able to withstand a variety of outcomes given this uncertain economic landscape. Thanks, Samantha. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, so let me come back to you then, Bavia. So how can banks like Bank One help Africans meet their wealth and investment growth aspirations? Uh, do you have any tips or suggestions that I'm sure our listeners would love to hear for us? Say, <laughs> uh, so, so, look, this is probably one of the core reasons why banks like Bank One exist, right? And um, being being in Mauritius with the Mauritian advantage, which I'll talk about later, means what international banks like us can do is provide access to the best of the world to clients, right? But but let me just maybe chat through some of. Uh, my thoughts around uh, opportunities, right? And I do want to specify to everyone that these are, you know, not recommendations. These are personal views. They come with all the health warnings you can imagine because every need is different, right? Uh, so I think, I think, you know, you need expert advice, but, but I think, look, the, the scene that has been set so far is that markets are in a fragile equilibrium and there's a lot of uncertainty, right? It's a complicated environment, lots of uh, tailwinds and headwinds. Um, investors, as a result, are going to need to hedge their bets, right? They, they, you can't, there is no sure shot winner in my view. Uh, but, but, some of the, you know, in my view, the tactical positionings that could happen are probably around four themes. So, so, so the first one is around the whole uncertainty about growth and re recession, right? Uh, what will be the rate of growth? Will we have soft landing, hard landing, et cetera, et cetera? I think, you know, when, whenever there is a recession uncertainty, then one of the things that most investors can do is go overweight on cash for liquidity and flexibility. Now, the great news is that interest rates are high, and this is probably as good a time as any to be able to lock in some very exciting fixed deposits, right? Whatever currency you talk about. So I think I think the recession uncertainty means a key tactical theme would have to be around stay overweight on cash. Uh, the, the other theme that I'll talk about, and we've talked a lot about government debt and whatnot, is at this point in time, I think we will reach a scenario of fairly attractive bond yields. Liquidity remains a concern, right? And new issuances of bonds to fund the deficit spending will remain high. So there, there is some question around the capacity in the market to absorb more gills, uh, which could actually create some opportunities. So, so in an environment like that, one of the tactical kind of positioning that is possible is to go overweight on high yield floating rate, short duration kind of bonds, particularly those focused on emerging markets. And then the third theme that we've, we've talked a lot, all of us about is inflation and how do you mitigate against inflation, right? And uh, in, in, in that kind of uh, worldview, some of the tactical activities that are possible is to go overweight on real assets uh, as a hedge against sticky inflation. Uh, things like real estate, which I think you know, everybody's been talking about, commodities, etc., are very attractively priced and great way to mitigate against inflation. And then, of course, uh, everybody is more up upbeat about growth next year than now, but growth will not be for everyone. It's going to be mixed. So I think there will always be some selective opportunities to go over it on some small cap, so uh, companies, you know, where, where you're able to stabilize earning estimates with attractive valuation. So I think I think there are lots of ways you could tactically position investment opportunities within an environment as fragile as currently is. But 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 all that said, uh, look, I, I, it would be remiss of me to not mention that equities in the long run still remains the best place to be. Right. However. 
the playbook for equities that had worked in the last 10 years won't necessarily work for the next 10 years. Um, within a, such a more uncertain environment, valuations become even more important. And I think a very sensible investing approach within equities to generate excess returns in this new regime is to be able to balance growth and value factors. I think historically people have just chased the, the, the company's driving growth, but I think value factor becomes important. I think there's a whole theme uh, which is becoming stronger around investing in durable growth, uh, companies that are driving durable growth. Uh, think about organizations that are able to kind of counter against the recession and macro risks we discussed. Uh, and, 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 and the other key kind of equity theme in an uncertain environment like now is to actually change the time horizon and to look really long term into investment opportunities that are for the future. And that would include things like artificial intelligence, you know, chat GPT is something that everybody's been obsessing about news last week and whatnot. But think broader around the semiconductor ecosystem, the whole AI infrastructure. Uh, the other kind of like real long term uh, challenge which will create opportunities is the healthcare innovation. So basically drugs, bioprocessing, etc. And ESG, I think we mentioned climate a couple of times. Uh, so, you know, this can all feel very complicated because there are multiple themes uh, that you could kind of focus on. Uh, and that is why it's really, really important to be working with experts, right? Uh, so so I've got to make the shameless plug about Bank One. Um, uh, so, so the first thing for Bank One is it really leverages that Mauritian advantage of being in a safe jurisdiction with a very attractive fiscal and tax regime and really good access to hard currency, something that is a challenge for most African markets, right? Um, we've got a whole range of very attractive uh, fixed deposit and other products across various currencies. We've got a market leading custody solution that gives our clients access to over 65 markets around the world, over 100 kind of fund houses around the world. This is how uh, we can offer the best opportunities in the world to clients in Africa, not just what's happening in Africa, right? Uh, and, 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 and through our platforms, we are able to kind of cover all tradable asset classes that are possible. But more importantly, we've got a range of uh, qualified uh, elite uh, RMs, as you call them, who can really help clients who are looking to understand very fragile economy, complex kind of headwinds and tailwinds. How do I navigate my opportunities around it? We've got RMs who will work with clients to understand those challenges and opportunities and actually provide access to, uh, you know, expert partners for advice if that was the right thing, etc. But look, uh, I, I do believe uh, in, in a nutshell that... Uh, there are a lot of opportunities that are starting to emerge as we've gone through the, the cycle of the last 18 months, but it is not a one size fits all. There are various themes that, you know, uh, any, any, any individual might want to think of depending on tenor, risk appetite, time horizon, etc. Uh, so, hey, you know, uh, my advice to everyone is you've got to talk to experts about it. And uh, Bank One would be very happy to be that. So reach out to me on my team and uh, we can definitely help. Thank you, Bavia. Well, this has been a very wide ranging discussion and I'm glad to say that the number of questions have come through. Uh, so let me get started with a question from Ashik, which I will put first of all to, uh, to Manisha. Uh, so Ashik's question is, with the lessons learned during the COVID-19 pandemic, how far do you think African countries are ready to financially resist potential future crises like a third world war or pandemics similar to COVID? Uh, what would you say there, Manisha? Mm. Uh, well, I first of all would like to say that the African countries have actually been quite resilient. And if you look at many of uh, the other economies, let's say, uh, even an economy like China that had to close and uh, 
uh, well, close doors and, and make sure that people don't uh, come through uh, closing the, uh, the manufacturing facilities, etc. We didn't really see a lot of that across Africa. And I have to add another thing. In Africa, most of us are used to having shots. So the fact that as soon as the government said, ah, well, all of you need to be vaccinated, I think all of us started uh, queuing up to go and uh, vaccinate. We didn't think twice that much, as in many other countries where people were, we were actually recip well, late recipients of vaccines, but we were very much wanting to have. The third thing is African countries have got a system in place. So, for example, because uh, many of the African countries have been uh, faced with um, things such as Ebola crisis and, and many such crises that have come up, that we have systems in place. Uh, when you get into Mauritius, you have, you first uh, clear the passports and immigration office, and the second uh, gate you clear is the um, health office. And, it, and if you go across many of the African countries, this system has been in place. Well, let's say if you're going to Europe, you only have one clearance and there wasn't. Now they've put in like a camera to know if you have fever, etc. But those were not there. But while many of the African countries were already prepared because we're used to many of those type of prices. The other thing that I would uh, applaud our African countries is this resilience, whether it is in terms of uh, the products that we are producing, most of the production continued. The second thing is with respect to our food, uh, while we do uh, import quite a lot from out of uh, out of Africa, we do also have alternative sources of food inside other continents. So whether it is millet, pap, uh, uh, you know, you name it, we have alternative that we could go to in case if there was not enough rice, if there was not enough wheat that was coming in. Of course, it created issues, but it still means that we were able to uh, get all these. So in that, and at around that same time, there's something else which is very promising that has happened, which is the advent of the AFCFTA, which was uh, signed and actually came into uh, being where, with the ratification process around the same time as we were all battling COVID. So which means that the countries across the region have kind of signed a pact between uh, ourselves to say that we are going to try at least to work in collaboration with each other. Now, I hope there's no third world war and I hope we don't have a future COVID because uh, that's likely, of course, going to affect. But I do know that in terms of COVID, for example, many countries are building COVID resilience, whether it is Senegal, whether it is Rwanda, uh, countries like Botswana, or Mauritius are all beefing up their biopharmaceutical sector to make sure that we are not independent, we are not dependent on international aid on things such as medication and vaccines. So I think the COVID pandemic actually has opened our eyes to all of us on the fact that we need to be auto sufficient on some of uh, those specific items. Even Tanzania, for example, is one of the uh, in terms of the uh, World Health Organization is one of those countries that has achieved the highest levels uh, for World Health Organization and is positioning itself to be uh, a center for, for the region in terms of biopharmaceuticals. So certainly I, I'm quite optimist for the, for the continent. 
Thank you very much, Manisha. Uh, well, I think we've got time for two last questions uh, to Stephanie and to Bavia. So Stephanie, we do have one which is about East Africa, so I will uh, I'll hand this over to you. Um, so the question comes from Donus. So thank you, Donus, for joining us, uh, who says, thanks team for the great insights. So the question is, Rwanda and Kenya have announced the cancellation of the visa requirements for travelers across the continent. How do you think this could affect the economic outlook in the region? Good news, Donus asks. Stephanie, what do you think? Um, it is good news, I think, to uh, a small extent, because you have to look at the relationship between Rwanda and Kenya. What would we benefit in terms of the removal of the visa requirements? For Kenya, for example, it could be around tourism. So we are looking to boost our tourism and our tourist receipts. So there could be positive ripple effects from there. Um, in terms of work and jobs, that's in question for now. So I'd look at it from just to a small scale. It's still early days, but what I can see as a key low-hanging fruit, speci specifically for Kenya, even Rwanda as well, is on the tourism sector, just supporting the, the movement of people between those two nations, supporting the fragile tourist sector, which has been quite hard hit pre-COVID and has been gradually um, recovering post-COVID. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Um, so coming on then to the last question. So this was one for you, Bavia, on, on FX. So uh, thank you, Amos, for your question. So, uh, so the question is the following. A key concern is with FX, where evidently Africa and sub-Saharan African uh, currencies are quickly depreciating against hard currencies. So this directly feeds into the inflation we now see. So do we see this position changing in the medium to short term? And what sort of policies are being put in place? So this is from Amos, who's at Credit Europe Bank in the Netherlands. So thank you, Amos. Bavia, what do you think? All right. Uh, I'm actually, so let me give my view, but this probably, I think Stephanie is, is, is more of a subject matter on this. Uh, my view, uh, if I just start off, is um, I don't believe at this point in time that there is a clear pathway to remove the hard currency shortages in any of the African markets. Uh, I think that is going to remain a perpetual issue uh, for the near term at least, right? Uh, and, and this is exactly why I think it becomes really critical for businesses as well as individuals to have a very clear view and be very clear minded around what their business cycle and their cash flow cycle looks like. Uh, what currency do they need to buy goods and receive payments from? Do they need to do a conversion in between or leave it in FX to be able to then reuse without having to worry about the volatility and shortage? I think this requires real proper, for at an individual and a company level, uh, proper kind of treasury management almost, right? And being able to actually bank in a jurisdiction that, that doesn't create unnecessary restrictions or barriers to be able to manage it. And that, that's probably one of the reasons why Mauritius thrives. Uh, now, in terms of what the governments are looking to do in Africa, let me actually differ maybe on that second part. Stephanie, if you want to add anything on that. Yes, um, sure. Yes, so now um, most African countries are working around a sort of like managed FX regime, which is understandable given that majority of African nations are net importers, like um, Manisha had even mentioned before. So the concerns of how exposed we are as nations is a key concern for governments, and that's the reason why it seems like we're in a managed FX regime. Uh, regime. So one of the policies I see that could be supportive, but it won't necessarily remove the issues that Bavia has mentioned, will be around allowing the local currencies to depreciate. This is making it more flexible, more floating. These are remarks we've had from the IMF before, especially for nations in their program. So allowing for a, a more flexible regime, floating regime, just to restore confidence in the FX market, to ensure the execution of trades are happening at a fair price, and as well as a predictable price, which may help rejuvenate the FX market. But so far, there is a sort, some sort of aversion, given that net importer state and how exposed these nations are. But that's the 
one solution I feel may be supportive for now. I've also seen some governments looking at um, new export markets for their goods, especially for those who are net importers. So new export markets just to, you know, widen their reach, improve export receipts and just be supportive of let's say dollar flows into their nations. That's also one way that the governments are, are working together with their ministries and their foreign service bodies to just improve on export receipts. Whether it will work, I do not think so because a majority of this will be a, is a confidence game rather. So how the governments are able to, you know, just ensure that investors and the people are confident that they will get a fair price for the currencies that they hold is the question. Thank you, Stephanie. We've got a last couple of points before we wind up, Stephanie. I'll just put this one quickly to you, uh, which is from Kagwa, who says, which is riskiest right now, equity funds, bonds, or money markets? <laughs> a quick one for you, Stephanie. Yeah. Oh, that that, that, that one is... I'll just mention one word, equities. Let's move on, Bavia. <laughs> <Do you think? laughs> but obviously, riskiest. So, so, no, so, so, yes, equities obviously is is riskier right as an asset class but it depends on what your requirement is and what is your risk appetite what is the time horizon you're talking about then it may not be right and so so this is what i i, I guess why i wanted to kind of jump in on that is i don't believe it's 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 humanly possible to say this is more or less risky there are so many factors on it and even if you think about equity what sector are we thinking about is it more value oriented rather than growth which is the theme in the current end is it more focused on uh, the the longer term horizons around AI, healthcare, etc. as I mentioned, right? It depends. Bonds, are we talking about emerging market, short duration? Are you looking to hold the bond? I think that that kind of differentiates what the risk is. So I think I think my, my short answer uh, or long answer here, Kagwa, is that uh, uh, this is where experts would come in, right? Is who would actually spend time with you to understand what are you trying to achieve? What, what period... How, what portion of your kind of total investable amount this amount is, et cetera, et cetera, to be able to help kind of provide a view on what's the right path. Thank you, perfect. Well, we're, so we're, sorry, we're, Stephanie, yeah. it's not a simple equity. <laughs> no, no, I, I was just, I was just <laughs> some light banter there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to say, we're almost at the end. I've got one question where Manisha, see if you can answer this in three words. Uh, we have a question from Nirish, uh, which is about the importance of governance. Um, are, are there like three jurisdictions, uh, Manisha, which you think have made a continued and uh, sustained efforts to improve their governance? Can you just give us three names? Because that's all we've got time for. <laughs> yes, there are a lot of countries that have been continuously improving their governances. Uh, I would cite, uh, I don't want to make, like, create issues here, but <laughs> a lot of the Eastern yeah, African yeah. countries have been good. Because <laughs> I don't want to cite the name of one and then others like, ah, but our country as well. But, you know, like uh, even a small country like Burundi has been um, looking at changing many things. We've seen uh, in uh, Tanzania being really good at uh, putting in not just accountability and, uh, well, transparency but also investing a lot in the people in the country we've seen countries even like countries such as uh, mozambique which were outliers for a very long time but where a lot of uh, support is being given on uh, this whole aspect same thing for malawi i think this investment in the people investment in transparency and accountability is something that is going on and I have to say as well, it's not just the government that is doing it. It's also something that the private sector is doing. And also a lot of geo NGOs are doing, but a lot of private sector are doing it. And also private sector are facilitating this process. Like, for example, when we're looking at transparency and accountability, the only fact that you can if you see something, you have a technology, you can send 
whatever act of uh, not bad governance that has happened through the technology to uh, complaints uh, location in in many of the countries across our region all these have been facilitated by the private sector and the private sector input so anyway this is a little bit <laughs> <laughs> thank you Venetia no, that's very helpful. In fact, we've got one very last question, which has literally got Bavia's name almost on it. Uh, so the question comes from Priya. She says, how can we get in touch with Bank One for opening an account? Bavia, I'm sure you can tell us the answer. Of course, <laughs> of course. Look, uh, multiple ways, right? Uh, Priya, uh, you could go to bankone.mu. There's a section on contact us and obviously we will contact you. Or easier still, you could write to us at Elite Bank which is E-L-I-T-E -E, banking at bankone.mu and just drop us uh, your number and we'll call you and we take you from there. Perfect. Thank you very much, Bavia. So, uh, well, well, I think that takes us to the end of our discussion today. So thank you, Bavia. Thank you, Stephanie and Manisha for sharing all of your insights. Uh, thanks to everyone for joining us. And um, we're glad to say that Bank One will be continuing with its webinar series again in the new year. So do stay tuned on our social media to, uh, to find out more and uh, look forward to seeing you all then. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank, thank you. you, Samantha. Thanks all. Thank you, Bavia. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. Uh, thanks uh, for the questions as well. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.